Great, thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> thanks, John, for having us, hosting us here today. And um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Mary Good. I am the lead for Institutions of Higher Education Investigations on the school support section in the COVID-19 response here at CDC. Um, I wanna start out by acknowledging that CDC sits on the ancestral lands of the Muscogee Creek and very near to the Eastern Cherokee Band. Um, I also, the kit, you might've seen my thumbs up. I should have done a high five of the mitten because I am also from um, the Lower Peninsula of Michigan and the Three Fires Confederacy area. So the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi tribes. Um, so I just want to make that acknowledgement first. Um, we are very excited here to talk to you a little bit about um, the collaborations that CDC can do with institutions of higher education, tribal colleges and universities. We know that tribal colleges and universities as well as tribal communities have been disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we really want to um, extend an opportunity with tribal colleges and universities to collaborate on projects and understand COVID-19 issues of concern in your communities. And so here we're, we're here to talk a little bit more about that today. And John, can I have next slide, please? So over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, Cases and clusters of COVID-19 have occurred on many college and university campuses. Campuses have implemented policies and prevention measures of various types to help decrease transmission in high density spaces like classrooms, dining halls, and student living spaces. CDC is interested in collaborating with colleges and universities to better understand the impact of prevention measures and testing strategies, the Delta variant, now the Omicron variant, and COVID-19 vaccination on COVID-19 transmission. We look to build partnerships with health departments and with IHEs, as well as other entities like the Indian Health Service to answer questions related to COVID-19 transmission in young adults and the impact of prevention measures to build the evidence base on which measures are most effective in lowering transmission. Today, we're gonna to talk about opportunities for collaboration between CDC and tribal colleges and universities um, to help you address the questions and concerns you have regarding the impact of COVID-19 on your campus communities. We know that you know best what is happening in your communities and we want to help you to sort of support the science and the gathering of more information about how you can prevent the spread. So after I briefly introduce the school su support section's work and how we typically partner with colleges and universities, we'll open the floor to hear more about your questions, your concerns, and your best practices. Next slide, please. So we've learned a lot so far in our collaborations on public health projects with institutions of higher education, or what I'll sometimes refer to as IHEs, and with K-12 schools. Many of our findings in school settings have been broadly applicable to larger community settings. To summarize what we've learned over the course of our partnerships with colleges and universities. So first, in locations where masks are mandated or required, mask use is high on college and university campuses. And we learned that from our Mask Up project, which I'll go into more detail about a little bit later. We've also learned that layering prevention strategies can reduce the risk of transmission. So that includes vaccination, masks, physical distance, screening testing, ventilation, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, staying home, contact tracing, and cleaning and disinfection. Next slide, please. Additionally, we've learned that close contact team sports, indoor sports, and activities like choir concerts, symposiums, indoor poster sessions, perhaps powwows, increase transmission risk. Increased testing, timely contact tracing, adequate isolation and quarantine, screening testing, and communication campaigns can help control COVID-19 outbreaks. And transmission in college and university settings is facilitated by on and off campus congregate living settings and activities. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on that a little bit later in the, the presentation. So while we've learned quite a bit about COVID-19 transmission at colleges and universities and K-12 schools, much work remains. So we look forward to continually partnering with colleges and universities to better understand how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 on college campuses. We know what works now, but we can also find out more um, about transmission and how to control the spread in particular settings. Next slide, please. So I'll pause here just to answer any questions that might have come up so far. Um, and then I'll give a few examples of public health projects that CDC has worked on with colleges and universities since the pandemic began. So any questions thus far? Uh, 
All right, hearing none, um, next slide, please. So now we'll go into some examples of previous collaborations with colleges and universities. Next. Our first example is Mask Up, Mask Adherence Surveillance at Colleges and Universities Project. Next slide. Our Mask Adherence Surveillance at Colleges and Universities Project, or Mask Up, ran from February through May of 2021. And I believe this was actually our biggest collaboration with the highest number of um, schools to date all at once. The project was an observational study measuring mask use. It included a knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs survey on masks and COVID-19 vaccines. We also ended up doing a smaller study that included a mental health portion of the survey. As shown in the map on the right-hand side of the slide, 54 colleges and universities in 21 states participated. The two states with the largest number of IHEs participating were Maryland with seven and Pennsylvania with nine. All but one location mandated wearing masks indoors on campus. Next slide. Out of over 87,000 observations, many of those made by college students um, that were working as research assistants, nearly 84,000 of those people were observed wearing a mask. When examining mask adherence by location, we found that 99% of people who were observed riding transportation, such as campus shuttles, wore a mask, 95% of people wore a mask when on campus, and 85% of people wore a mask when observed at nearby off-campus locations, such as retail stores, coffee shops, and bus stops. Next slide, please. So now we get into um, another um, study that we did, and this one was looking specifically at types of testing. So this resulted in a morbidity and mortality weekly report, which is the CDC weekly journal article or journal um, that was titled Implementation of a Pooled Surveillance Testing Program for Asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 Infection on a College Campus, Duke University, Durham, North Carolina, August to October 2020. Next slide, please. So this is another example of, in a very different kind of way, of what we can do to collaborate with um, IHEs to understand SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 transmission. We conducted with this with Duke University in 2020. And what it was, was a pooled testing study. And pooled testing means combining the same type of specimen from several people and conducting one laboratory test on the combined pool of specimens to detect the illness, that, the virus that causes COVID-19. Pooled tests that return positive results then require each specimen in the pool to be retested individually to determine which individuals are positive. But the advantages of pooling include preserving testing reagents and resources, reducing the amount of time required to test large numbers of specimens, and, and lowering the overall cost of testing. So briefly, when Duke reopened, Students were required to quarantine at home for 14 days prior to arrival. On arrival, all students had entry screening for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, and were sequestered in dorm rooms or off-campus housing until they received the results. Several other prevention strategies were implemented, including single occupancy, occupancy dorms, modifying classrooms, um, packaging meals, and so on. In addition, all students were required to sign a Duke compact where they agreed to adhere to different kinds of policies. Um, so frequent testing included collection of supervised self-administered nasal swabs. Undergrads living on campus were tested twice weekly, off-campus undergrads one or two times per week, and grad students about once per week. Um, from August 2nd through October 11th, 41 symptomatic students were identified at the time of entry test, entry into quarantine, or among those who reported symptoms in the symptom monitoring app. Entry testing and contact tracing also identified 14 asymptomatic students with COVID-19, so no trace of symptoms at the time. 10,265 students participated in the pooled testing. Um, so given the numbers, this greatly reduced the cost to do pooled testing as well the time um, to getting those results. Importantly, this article demonstrated that pooled testing of nasal swab specimens allowed for rapid identification of infected students um, and faculty and staff. The large proportion of infections, nearly half, identified in asymptomatic students highlights the importance of combining preventive measures with comprehensive surveillance. 
So this approach allowed Duke to remain open for the first 10 weeks of classes without substantial outbreaks among residential or off-campus populations. Next slide, please. Another MMWR, and this study is again kind of looking at ways of prevention and transmission on campus, resulted in a title, Participation in Greek Life and the Spread of COVID-19 Among Residential Communities in Arkansas, August 20 th 21st through September 5th, 2020. Next slide, please. So this is another study that led to a publication. At the start of the 2020-2021 academic year, COVID-19 cases increased rapidly at an Arkansas university. 965 cases of COVID-19 were identified and associated with the university with 37% of those cases from students involved in Greek life. Network analysis of the group students interacted with was performed to understand the spread of COVID-19 across the campus community. Network analysis indicated that 91% of gatherings were associated with fraternity or sorority activities. Recruitment events held virtually were associated with fewer cases than those held in person. Next slide, please. So understanding networks can provide insights into COVID-19 transmission dynamics and inform effective mitigation strategies. We understand that tribal colleges and universities probably don't have the same kind of robust fraternity and sorority life that many four-year traditional colleges might have, but we do understand that there might be other kinds of social groups um, or extracurricular activities where the same kind of network analysis could apply. In the absence of detailed person-to-person -person transmission data from contact tracing, network analysis using available data on place of residence and involvement in on-campus and off-campus activities was used to describe this university's transmission network, potential gatherings where transmission might have taken place, and links between nodes or individuals within the entire social network that might have been involved in transmission. The network visualization tool depicted algorithm de detected gatherings to identify links indicating likely recent contact. Visualized in real time, information from such links and networks could support implementation of targeted prevention activities, such as isolation of cases and quarantining of contacts. Next slide, please. So I'll now, now talk about the ways in which colleges and universities can partner with CDC to learn more about how to prevent COVID-19 on their campus and in their community. I also just briefly want to give a shout out to our Tribal Support Section Communications team member, Kaylee Tony of the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian Community who created these wonderful images for us. We'll go through the process of what we do step by step, but one important thing to remember is that we can be flexible to accommodate your school's needs, your timeline, and your goals. Next slide. So in evaluating, planning, and implementing projects, next slide, please. Each project begins with an invitation into the jurisdiction or setting by the state, local, or tribal public health authorities to let CDC know they're interested in meeting. After that initial engagement, CDC's school support section facilitates a meeting with state, local, or tribal public health authorities and the college or university. Our main goal in this initial meeting step is to listen to how things are going during the pandemic for your institution and what questions or concerns you have identified that you might want assistance in investigating and addressing. Our central focus here is understanding your needs and interests. What would be most beneficial to understand about COVID-19 and its effects on your campus? Next slide, please. Based on that conversation, CDC drafts a project proposal and puts together study instruments such as surveys, interview guides, and other materials. We work closely with your team to make sure we cover the areas of interest. Depending on the college or university's capacity, we can work directly with interested faculty or staff, or even incorporate student assistance on the project. Our model is flexible to allow as much collaboration as you would like, but we also understand that colleges and universities are often stretched thin and we can support the project if needed. Next. One second, please, as my dog goes crazy. Meow. Sorry that someone knocked on the door and really angered my large dog. <laughs> okay, so um, can we edit that part out? <laughs> um, 
So step three, <laughs> working together, the materials and timeline are developed. We identify a timeline that works with the rhythm of the school term. It always seems to happen when you're in the middle of a, a presentation. <laughs> Next slide, please. CDC is able to send small teams to the college or university site to help with project kickoff and data gathering if needed. Sometimes this also allows us to build relationships and provide technical assistance to staff. We can also do this remotely if needed. And having CDC staff on site also helps us get a feel for the particular needs and contexts of the college or university. Next slide. CDC helps with data collection, cleaning, and analysis. We ensure adequate feedback loops are in place as preliminary data and further analyses become available. Data are given to school administrators so that they can make decisions and adjustments as needed. Again, we can meet with your team through this process to keep everybody up to date, or we can manage the process completely. And next slide, please. And finally, in collaboration with the college or university, CDC writes up and distributes findings. We can provide technical assistance and an interpretation through webinars or support the publication of results so that other similar colleges and universities can learn from your institution's findings. So this can be anything from an internal report to a um, peer reviewed journal article or some other kind of major distribution um, so that others can learn from the findings. As with all of our projects, your institution will have complete control over data collected and we only publish or distribute findings with your permis permission and your participation. Next slide. So now let's hear from you. What questions do you have? What kinds of issues or concerns have you had to address over the course of the pandemic? So we understand that tribal communities have really strong connections with the tribal colleges and universities and often serve as really important meeting places for the community. So what sorts of strengths or challenges did these links present over the course of the pandemic? And I'm happy to answer any other questions about potential collaborations as well. Thank you. So Mary, can I stop sharing the screen at this point? Um, I think we have one more slide too, or a couple more slides. But yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Do you wanna to advance to the next slide, John? Sure. Oh, we also have another yes um, image here. So we would also be really interested in hearing about prevention strategies or unique practices that worked well for you over the last school year, challenges that have arisen, things that you've seen and what you're interested in finding out more about. And next slide. I could, was just going to thank everybody again for being part of this session. Um, and we're really excited to discuss partnering with you on public health projects. Um, you or your college or university. Um, so we have here, I've listed my email address um, on the slide as well as the COVID-19 school fieldwork mailbox. So this is sort of the universal um, inbox for our team. So if you have questions or would like to get in touch with us for um, additional engagement with your college or university, these are the, the, the emails to contact. So any other questions or comments?